Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Second Branch and friends. Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? Great, great, great. So we want to ask you to go ahead and stand with us as we get the church started this morning. The church started. <laughs> and we're going to ask you to stand as we sing our first hymn. Um, it's 781 in your hymn books, but it's also going to be on your screen. Um, it is Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Is that the right number? 581. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Amen.
seated. Good morning, Second Branch. Oh, that was that was okay. Uh, let's try that one more time. Thank you. See, I always. Good morning, Second Branch. Amen. Thank you so very much. Hey, listen, I want to thank all of you who have joined us this morning. Those of you who are joining us online, my name is Pastor Eric. I'm one of the pastors here, and we want to thank you so very much for being with us this morning and coming to um, worship with us. Before we get started on anything else, I want to thank everyone who participated in the women's event yesterday, the women's event with WMU um, Health event. Thank you very much. Understand that there were lives changed and a lot of people were, um, let's just say, made aware of some things that they needed to work on in their lives. And if that's not something special, I don't know what is. I'm looking, I'm kind of prolonging this. I'm looking for somebody that's not here yet, but that's okay. So um, I want to go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer, if I may. Can I do that? Okay, cool. I'm just making sure. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for yet just another wonderful, wonderful day. God, thank you for waking us up this morning with the full usage of our limbs and our minds. Father, we thank you that we can see and hear the beauty that you have bestowed upon us this day. God, we pray right now that somebody that's in this room or maybe somebody that's watching us online who is heavy burden right now, that's just struggling right now. God, we pray that you would put your arms around them and love on them and care for them and let them know that they're not in this by themselves, that, that you would never leave them, that you would never forsake them, that you're always there for them, and so are we. Father, we, Father, we thank you um, again for the, um, our, every person here, the leaders that are here, those who you know, just want to uh, live a life that is honoring and glorifying unto you. And Father, we ask now that we would all breathe and get ready to praise your holy name in song. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to start with another song with the praise team this morning called God So Loved the World. And if you'll stand and join with us, you may not know all the words, but they're on the screen and you can join in when you get ready. Amen. Amen.
his one and only son to save us and he's still waiting there with open arms there might be some people here that don't know Christ like we do and so it's our job to just make sure we continue to give them that word so they can know, come to know Christ as he waits there with his arms open amen amen, amen. how many of y'all are thankful for God's grace this morning because we know sometimes we can be some bad folks amen <laughs> <laughs> and, and his grace is certainly sufficient for us amen amen, amen.
praise him. We thankful for his grace this morning. Amen. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you again for your grace and your mercy, which covers us all week long, God. We thank you for waking us up this morning and, and making it so that we can get to the house of the Lord and sing your praises, God. We thank you that the word that's coming forth will be a word that will carry us through the weeks. And God, we just thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Second Branch. I think I did a little better than you, Pastor Eric. They're woke up now. So. The key is to always go after the music. Whether we're singing the old hymns or whether we're singing the new hymns, man, I'm all in. I love the music that we do here at Second Branch. Got a lot of announcements for you this morning, so you need to listen fast, okay? We are participating in communion this Sunday. If you have not gotten your sacraments, uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll have one of our people come and give them to you. Anybody up in the balcony? Looks like we're all covered. Uh, at the end of that, uh, you may use the, throw away the disposable cup that you're using. We'll throw it away outside in the trash cans. Next thing. Connect cards, you see those in the back of uh, the pews. And if you would like to fill one of those out so we know a little bit more about you or if you've been here a long time and you've just felt led to serve uh, in, in one of our activities, you can do that. Uh, it has some things on the back such as if you would like to ask Jesus into your life or whether you'd wanna be baptized or become part of our second branch family. So it's a wide range of things that uh, may interest you on that. Uh, also want to mention the giving boxes in the back on the way out. If you want to put your envelope or any other kind of donations you'd like to make in that box, that would be great. Anybody go to breakfast this morning that the men cooked this morning? You guys are allowed to catch a little snooze here and there during the rest of the service, but everybody else has to stay awake. Um, very good food. First of uh, first Sunday of every month, family breakfast. The men cook that. Would love to see all of you come out there and enjoy that. It's a wonderful family time. On May 16th, after worship, we're going to go outside for food, games, and fellowship. So you can invite your friends to that, and you can sign up to help if you would like at the Welcome Center. Registration for is now open on the website for VBS, Vacation Bible School, and you can begin telling your friends and neighbors about that. I like the, the song that we sang. Uh, it was about uh, God's love was so great that he sent his son to save us, that we could be saved. And that's what we're really here and we're all about, is learning more about Jesus and learning how that we can experience that unending love of God and salvation in our own lives. So if you are questioning that or if that's been going around in your mind, don't leave today until you talk to us, uh, one of our pastors, one of our ladies, one of our deacons. And if you can't find any of them, I sit right back in the corner and uh, we'll be glad to walk you through that and to uh, talk with you about that. God bless each and every one of you. in church and um, so basically I was kind of taught you know this is the way you live and this is what's right and I don't know this year I got bored with it and I just wasn't on the fire I used to be on and I was kind of lost with that it just kind of took a toll on my life in that way and I decided that following my friends would be a lot more fun and there was one time they invited me to a party and I just decided hey why not let's go I started seeing these people come in and they're they're playing beer pong and like they're doing all this crazy stuff and I see my friend and he's like totally wasted and all these other people and then someone brought out a pack of weed and I had never been around that. My friends were kind of just like, you know, this is normal and it's okay, you, should, you just need to get used to it. That was really difficult in that way to um, see them sin and all I wanted to do was tell them no, and um, the easiest way for me to do that was through prayer. I would just sometimes 
you know, I would just talk to God and say, hey, like, I'm just frustrated and I need you to just reach to these people. And it was more of a prayer of like, God, forgive them for what they are doing. And I pray that um, they would just seek you and God, they would just come to know who you are and um, know your love. And I pray that I would be able to be used by you to reach them as well. One time I invited one of my friends to church, same girl who had influenced me negatively and um, that way. And I said, hey, will you please just come to church with me this one time? So she's like, fine. And she came with me and my pastor said, you know, like raise your hand if you've never had a relationship with Christ and you would want one. And she raised her hand and I wasn't expecting it. So when I saw her hand raise, I just started, I began to weep. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Like. I'd been waiting for that moment to see my friends go through what I had gone and feel what I had felt. They finally understood. And so um, they're here now and, you know, they come to Wednesday night services and it's just awesome to see and fellowship with my friends in that way. If you're here with us, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors as well here at Second Branch. If you're joining us online, Welcome. Thank you so much. It is May the 1st, and it's a beautiful day outside here in Virginia, and um, I hope that you guys will be able to enjoy some of that weather today. That um, video that you just saw pertains to the message that we're going to be um, experiencing together this morning, but there's, it comes from a website that we have purchased as a church, and we are giving that away um, allowed to give that away to every family member in our church membership and every family member that is connected to our church membership and every family member in our neighborhoods that are surrounding us. Essentially, we're partnering with an organization that says, we want to help you engage your, your membership as well as your community with Christ-centered, um, with Christ-centered video content. So it's, a, it's, it's essentially a Christian Netflix and um, it has many, just thousands of hours of video content for children, as well as um, Bible studies or perhaps discussion starters. If you're, a, um, if you're a, a parent and you're wanting to be able to engage your young person, your teenager, and it's not as cool to sit down across the couch and talk about stuff, but you could show a three-minute video like that and say, what does it look like in your context to pray for your friends at school, et cetera? This is a free service, and we sent out a couple emails this week to let you know about that. If you did not receive that email, fill out a Connect card with your email address that is legible and drop that in the um, giving box on your way out and just say, um, please sign me up for the emails, and we'll make sure that you get that. Um, it is a free service, and we're hoping that we can sign up as many people that would like to have that as possible. Share it with your coworkers, with, um, with your family that lives in other states. We, as a church, wanted to bless our world, and this is one way of doing that. I want to talk with you this morning about carrying burdens for people, and I'm going to tell you that uh, these three things, to be a burden carrier, you can't be a burden giver, to be a burden carrier, you must be a burden sharer, and you must be a burden barrier. Those are the three things that we're going to talk about as we go along. I'll give you more detail. I'd like for you to open up your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 5, and um, we're not going to have notes on the screen. I have plenty of notes, but if you're a note taker, I'll try to make sure that I move slowly for you to write down the information that you need to, uh, to apply that to your lives as we go on this week. But we're in the book of Galatians. We actually did an entire six-week study on spiritual fruit. If you remember that, if you were coming and worshiping with us um, in the month of, of uh, late March and into April, we were talking about spiritual fruit. And, um, and, and so we're going to revisit that just a little bit, starting here in verse 25 of chapter 5. I'm reading from the English translation called the NIV. Your English translation may sound differently than mine. It says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, this is 6 and 1, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. This, uh, this idea when, when Paul says you who are spiritual, he's, he's saying this. If 
you are walking by the Spirit, if you're living by the Spirit, then the fruit of the Spirit is growing inside of you. And if God is growing His fruit in you, then you are now spiritual. It's not because a person has the ability to do that on their own. God himself is changing this person, and that's who Paul is talking about here. If you're a person who's walking by the Spirit, you're not perfect, but you're living by the Spirit, then you are now spiritual, and you should restore people who are caught in sin gently. Watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. That's six and two. And that's kind of where we are today. This entire message is talking about this idea of carrying a burden with someone else or for someone else. So we're returning back to this fruit of the Spirit. This, This walking by the Spirit, Paul says in verse 26, is a rejection of the idea that you should be self absorbed. Self-centered, that the world revolves around you, your wants, your desires, your personal opinions or preferences. That's what Paul says. You have to reject that because when God himself resides in you, he wants to grow him and not you. Like he is the one that is growing in you. And because of that, you are along for the ride and God allows you to be living with him as a uh, walking in the Spirit. So you have to understand that Paul's saying the rejection of self-absorption is necessary in order for you to become a burden carrier. That's why I said it this way in my introduction. To be a burden carrier, you must not be a burden giver. To be a burden giver means that I walk up to someone and I puke onto them. Blah! There's all my wants, all my desires, all my personal opinions, all my personal preferences, and blah, carry all this stuff for me. That's a burden giver. Paul says in 6 and 1, he says, if someone's messing up, then gently restore them back to the place that they are. Unfortunately, in many churches today, if a person's messing up, another person comes over to them and pukes their personal thoughts onto them and says, blah, get up and get dirty. I mean, you're dirty, get up and get clean. Like it's, it's this constant barrage of placing burdens on top of people that are already overburdened with their junk. To be a burden carrier, you can't be a burden giver. It's impossible. Early in my student ministry, I was doing something that was really dumb. I don't know that you would call it a sin, but it was just really dumb. I mean, really dumb. I'm gonna tell you what it is. We had... And I may have told some of you this before, so if I have, just bear with me. I'm getting old. you got grandkids. You're allowed to be called that, okay? So I, had, I was a youth pastor, and I had a group of kids. We were on a summer, a summer trip, and we were making a pit stop at a Walmart in order to pick up snackage and things like that that they're going to eat all week long. And when we were in the parking lot of Walmart, and it's, you know, it's five mile an hour zone, and I was obeying that. But the kids came out and some of them climbed up on the bumpers of the back of the van. And some of them climbed up on top of the vans and they started bouncing. And so as they're bouncing and there's thousands of teenagers all over the place and everybody, all the youth pastors said, you know, we're going to visit Walmart before we go over to where the summer camp is. There's, There's probably at this point, there's probably hundreds of kids that aren't mine all around. And so there's my kids bouncing on top of this van. And as we were doing that, we started creeping through the parking lot and kids started going, hey, you know, like this. And when we got back to our, own, I didn't go on public transportation roads, but as we, as we got over to the camp, we got in and the kids were laughing about it. And throughout the week, we were doing this stuff. And my kids would say, Chris, you're the best youth pastor ever. You know, and I'm like, yeah, this is amazing. I had an older man by the name of John who was one of our youth leaders. He was a grandparent. John was probably at that time in his 60s as a youth leader, getting like three and four hours of sleep every night. It was great. And John pulls me aside like this, this Galatians 6.1, and he lovingly puts his arm around me and he says, Chris, I need to talk with you about something. You ought not to do that with these kids on these vans. And I was like... I mean, what's it hurting, right? Like, like I'm the best youth pastor ever, and they're all walking around telling these kids, man, we got the best youth group in the world. 
And John says, but what happens if a kid falls off and gets run over? You know, and it's like in my little immature uh, ministry mind, still in my 20s and not many commentary on the rest of you 20-year-olds. That's, that's certainly me. I know that you're the smartest people in the room. But, the, <laughs> but for me, having a person come alongside me and gently loving me saying, Chris, I wouldn't do this. And here's why. It was life-changing for me. I didn't feel condemned. I didn't feel provoked into anger. It was an older person coming alongside me and saying, I want to give you some wisdom in a way that I am communicating to you that I am loving you. John didn't come alongside me and say, these kids are liars. They say, you're the best youth pastor in the world. You're the worst youth pastor in the world. When the world's a matter with you. I mean, you know, like that would have been condemning and judging Instead of understanding, okay, I get it. Chris has got some areas to grow in. And I'm going to carry this burden for him. You can't be a burden giver if you want to be a burden carrier. People are already overloaded. They don't even have to be living a sinful life. I mean, look, if a person walked into our church building today and you were able to assess by the way that they talked, by the context of their conversations, you were able to assess... I'm not so sure this person's walking with Jesus. I feel very confident that the majority of the people in this room would get it. They would understand, wow, this is a person that loves that needs Jesus. I need to show them the love of God. I feel very confident in that. The challenge I think that many churches have is that when there's two people that have claimed to walk with Jesus, and it could be for a year or a decade, And there is an issue there that the same level of understanding and grace and mercy and love is not shown between church members as it is to a random person that comes in off the street. Now, we pat ourselves on the back and we say, you know, at least we're not treating everybody, you know, in a a bad way. But we have to also wrestle with this concept that just because a person is saved does not mean that they're no longer carrying burdens. And people who are walking with Jesus, they have accepted Christ into their lives, still are burdened with things that they have to deal with every day. And when they come into the church with that, into the church building, the last thing that they need is for someone to puke another burden on top of them in order to put them in their place. Or try to say, hey, let me tell you all the ways that you're wrong and I'm right. That's burden giving, and Paul says, you can't do that, okay? If you are spiritual, it means you have revoked your personal preferences, your personal opinions. You have revoked everything about me, and I'm important. To be a burden carrier, you are walking with the Spirit, which means I can come alongside someone and gently help them by taking their burdens off of them. That's really difficult. I get that. Each of us has our own burdens. And when we lack grace to each other, we end up being a burden giver. That's why Eric has said, I've I've heard Eric say a number of times, um, it's better to be righteous than right. To be righteous means I'm going to be a burden carrier, not a burden giver. This is what I think is so critical Um, about what we're doing here at Second Branch. Because walking by the Spirit means walking with people who sin, not stepping over top of them. In sports, that for, for male sports, let me put it this way, for men's sports, to step over top of someone is one of the most disrespectful things that you can do on the field or on the court. You don't do that. Okay, And so when you are walking with someone who is in trouble, they've made mistakes or they've done something that's now not the right thing to do, you have an option of stepping over them and becoming a burden giver or you have the option of helping them up and say, let me take this off of you. When people come with their complaints, ah, you know, complaint, blah, 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 they're burden givers. They're saying, here's all of my junk, and I want you to now have to deal with all of this stuff. If you want to be a burden carrier, you don't say, oh, I'm so sorry that all this stuff is really bothering you. You say this, I understand that you're struggling with the sin of complaining, and I would love to help you carry that. 
how can I help you carry that sin? I mean, that's, a, that's lovingly coming alongside and saying, I, I get it, I get it. We're all dealing with junk. I get it. But let me carry this instead of saying, did you know that this person is complaining about everything? Now, now you're a burden giver to the person that didn't even need to hear that stuff. You know what I mean? Like this, it's, a, it's a cycle, a cyclical thing that churches have to be able to say, we're not going to exercise judgment on people. We're not going to exercise insolence on people. We're not going to be arrogant and assume that we're right instead of saying we need to be righteous. We need to walk with people in their sin. And those people may have been here for four days or four decades. you got to walk beside them. What does it mean to carry someone's burden? The Greek word means that this, this, this Greek for the word burden is uh, essentially like saying attaching a weight to your shoulders and it's kind of pulling you under. You're beginning to sink and then drown. You can't escape it. That's, that's what this, this word burden is talking about here in the Greek context there. And it isn't just helping someone financially, but I think we're very good at that. One of the things that we do, we're not, we're not doing it today, we, we, uh, it was just a misstep for us, but one of the things that we normally do on Communion Sunday is we receive an offering, a special offering at the end of the service. And that offering goes toward people who are in need financially. We call it our benevolence account. And right now, our church is, um, has helped so many people over the years, just since I've been here, and I know before I arrived, so many people we've helped financially over the years. We're really good at that stuff. If a kid needs Christmas presents, well, then say no more. We will make sure we lavish them with Christmas presents. But to carry someone's burden does not just mean to give them money when they're struggling financially. That might be a part of it. But contextually here, when it says to carry a person's burden, if you look at what the context is, they're talking about sin. They're not just talking about need, physical need. I mean, we're good at that stuff. Want to feed the homeless, man? We'll feed the homeless. We got people in the neighborhood over here struggling, man. We'll stock their pantry full of canned goods or we'll, we'll send them gift cards. We're really, really, really good at that stuff. But burden sharing and burden carrying here is talking about identifying that this person is broken and I'm not going to live in judgment on them. I'm going to help them up and I'm going to engage with the sin that is breaking them. I'm going to carry their sin. Now Paul says here, be careful when you do this because when you get involved and get your hands dirty carrying someone's sin, understand you too are susceptible to falling into that same thing. So you have to be very careful. But he does not say stay away from them and don't get involved because you may fall into the sin. What he says is walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, and help people carry their burdens and understand your power must come from here. You can't be strong enough on your own to not get involved in the sin that they're involved in. So I have to live by the Spirit and walk by the Spirit. Okay, so listen, let's keep going. To be a burden carrier, you must be a burden sharer. I'm going to explain what that means. If you want to carry someone's burden, you must first know how to share yours and be in an accountable position where you're sharing your burden. How in the world are we supposed to carry someone's sin, the thing that they're involved in, and say, I will help you through this, if we have never shared our own sin with someone who's helped us through what we're dealing with? Did we suddenly become Jesus, and now we can help with everybody, and we don't ever have to deal with anything on our own? To be a burden carrier, you must be a burden sharer. Those of you who are spiritual, Paul says, you have to set the example. And you're not just setting the example of how to live holy. I mean, that's part of it. You're also setting the example of how to receive forgiveness and healing for your unholiness. Some of the most, imp most powerful and impactful things that I have ever seen in my life is when a person stands up and they say, listen, man, God has healed me from something that was really tragic. Or God has brought me through something that I could not go through on my own. And I listen to that and I say, wow, if God has done that for them, maybe that he can do that for me. 
I've heard so many people share stories about how they've had reconciliation in relationships and when it seemed like it was completely uh, impossible for that to happen. God intervened and that person received forgiveness or that person gave forgiveness, that person received healing or that person gave healing. In order to be a burden carrier, you must be a burden sharer. And that's why we're creating a discipleship process here at Second Branch. Eric and James and Chuck have been working about how to create this system, this environment at Second Branch where people have the freedom to share their burdens. And remember, contextually, burdens is sin. It's hard enough to get humans, it's hard enough to get Americans to say, I'm having a hard time paying my bills this month. And sharing that kind of in a small private group. That's hard. Now imagine saying, I'm having a hard time because I've been stealing from my company. To be a burden carrier, you got to know how to share your own junk. You got to know that. People... People understand when you've been through it, they'll say, if you've been through it, then help me along the way. It's so important that we do that. I'm convinced, listen, the number, I'm I'm convinced this, the number one reason why the church has lost its power in the world is not because we don't evangelize enough, although I believe that that is true as well. It's not because we don't pray enough, although I believe we should be praying more. It's not because we don't have enough Bible studies, although Bible study is critical to understand who God is. It is because we do not share our burdens. You know how I know that? Because that's what this word says. Look at Galatians 6 and verse 2. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to carry someone's burden. Well, how am I supposed to know what burden to carry if they're not telling me what it is? James writes in chapter 5, confess your sin to each other so that you can pray for each other and then you'll receive healing. Well, how am I supposed to pray for someone unless they're confessing it to me? In in discipleship, it means to follow Jesus' teachings, to honor him with our lives, to say we're growing in our faith. In order to do that, we have to be able to carry each other's burdens. And in order to carry each other's burdens, we have to be telling people what our burdens are. And yet churches all across America have been the place where people come in to hide their burdens in order instead of coming in to share them. We have set up little mini societies inside churches that say, once you hit those doors, that smile goes on your face, and when people say, how are you doing, you respond with, fine. You know what I'm saying? Like we create this little society which says, I'm not going to talk about the things that I'm struggling and dealing with because I don't know that I can trust this person to actually carry me or are they going to step on me? And the law of Christ is fulfilled when churches carry each other's burdens. This place ought to be a place where people can come in, whether you've been here your entire lives and you're now 95 years old, or you've been here your entire lives and you're now nine. This place ought to be a place where you can come in and have the freedom to say, I am breaking in this particular area of my life. And people say, let me carry this with you. I will help you through this. Because I too have been broken in a similar way and God allowed me to be carried by him and someone else. That's when the church receives power. That's when the the community and society around starts looking and saying, what is going on over there? We call that in Christian words, revival. When people start honoring the law of Christ, which says, carry someone's burden. And we can't be burden carriers if we're not burden sharers. You got to know what yours is, first of all. We don't glory in our imperfection. We find comfort in it because we know when we're weak, the Bible says Christ is made strong. I don't find glory in all of the things that I'm broken in. 
But what I do find glory in is that in my brokenness, God's word says, while you were still in your sin, Christ died for you. So that Jesus looked down on me and he says, I don't pity you, I love you. And I will come down on your level and I will get my hands dirty and I will help carry your burden. I found comfort in that. And so therefore, I find it easy to be able to disclose, guys, I'm broken in certain ways. And I know publicly that's hard for some people to recognize. And it feels awkward and uncomfortable because we have this society of, "Mm, we don't talk about that stuff. But this is fulfilling the law of Christ. In order to carry someone, you have to know how to share you, you and yourself. To be a burden carrier, here's the third, third point here. To be a burden carrier, we must be a burden barrier. B-U-R-I-E-R, bury, like this. You got to know how to bury your burdens. It's supposed to be uh, this way. Paul says it earlier in this letter in Galatians chapter 2, I am crucified with Christ, meaning Jesus died, I die with him. Jesus was buried. I am buried with him. A couple weeks ago, we did baptism. Eric was up in the baptistry doing baptism. And when he was baptizing each person, he said, buried with Christ in baptism, raised again to walk in newness of life, which is what, Paul, what Eric said. That's essentially what Paul is saying here. When I am crucified, I am now dead to myself, and I am being buried with Christ as Christ was being buried. He says it in the book of uh, Romans chapter 8. He says it in Colossians chapter 3. The things that are sinful uh, among you, find a way to kill it. The word that he specifically uses is the root word for our English translation of murder. Paul is essentially saying murder the things that are sinful in your life. Learn how to bury it. Because you can't carry someone else's burden if you're still walking around proud of your own. Learn how to bury that thing. In order to bury it, listen to this. In order to bury it, you need to learn how to share it. Because two people digging a hole to bury it is a whole lot better than one. And I'll go as far as to say this. If you rely on yourself to bury the sin that you're involved in, you won't. Imagine saying this, it was really cool to see Jesus come back from the dead. That was really amazing. It didn't really change me. I mean, I kind of had it in my head how it was all working all, and and my life was kind of all together already. My life is good, but it's really cool to see that. And I go along unchanged. That person is not burying their burdens, and therefore they're in, it's impossible for them to learn how to carry someone else's. To be a burden carrier, you must be a burden share, a barrier. You've got to bury your burden, and it's easier, as I said, it's easier to bury something when there's another set of hands helping you dig, and that's why you have to be a burden sharer. You don't have to do this all by yourself. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I can't praise you because I hear that when you come together for worship, you got divisions among yourselves. In other words, in today's culture, he would say this, I hear that you don't like the way that your church is functioning and everybody's doing it wrong because they're not doing it the way that you want. That's what Paul is saying. That means that there are people that are saying, I'm not burying myself and being raised again in Christ. I'm carrying around my own life, and I want everybody to understand my life is what needs to be on display. And yet, communion says, we remember Jesus. And Paul says, and when you remember Jesus, put yourself on that cross as well, be buried with him, and when you raise again, it's not you any longer. It's Christ. This concept of burying your burdens is pervasive all throughout Scripture. That's called repentance. It said, I've got something that I have in my life. I'm going to confess this, James chapter 5, to a person who I know loves me, and they're going to pray with me so that I can find healing. Essentially, they're digging the grave to this sin that I'm so heavily involved in, and I'm saying, help me not dig this thing back up. 
Y'all remember the, uh, what I believe is one of the greatest country singers of all time, Garth Brooks? I'm dating myself. Some of y'all would say it was Hank Williams or George Jones. And I'm like, yeah, that was who my parents listened to. <laughs> Garth Brooks. He wrote a song called We Bury the Hatchet. You remember that? It's coming from a Native American uh, application where um, in Native American culture, when there was a peace bond that was being made, they would take the art, the artifact of war like a hatchet and they would dig a hole and they would bury the hatchet and they would cover it up. Essentially saying, we're now no longer going to fight and we're going to hide the tools that we were fighting with each other with. And Garth Brooks says, we bury the hatchet, but we leave the handle sticking out. That's the way that sometimes it comes when we're burying our burdens. We say, I'm putting this here, but I know exactly where it is so that I can go back and get it and pick it all up again. That's not repentance. That's fake repentance. That's going through the motions. That's saying, when I walk in, I'm putting a smile on and saying to everybody, I'm fine. When my life isn't, when I'm struggling. So you have to learn how to bury your burdens. Paul says it this way. This is what he says. When you come together in, verse, uh, in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, when you come together in worship, you actually make the place worse than you do making it better. You bring yourself to the table instead of bringing Jesus to the table. He's specifically talking about communion. He says, when you start going into the, the, uh, the commandment to observe the Lord's Supper, which was the... Um, the New Testament version of the Passover feast that the Israelites used to celebrate God's provision of rescuing them from death over oppression, death over slavery. Jesus says, you're not enslaved to a person, you're enslaved to a mindset. You're enslaved to sin, and I'm coming to set you free. That that went from the Passover feast to the Lord's Supper. We were celebrating the sacrifice of Jesus. And Paul says, when you come to the table of the church of Corinth, you're bringing your own person there. Jesus isn't anywhere to be found, and you're making this place worse. That's in the Word, 1 Corinthians 11. And he says, I'm begging you, I'm begging you to do it differently. He later writes, when you're remembering Jesus through this act of communion, examine yourself, he says. Examine yourself. Ask yourself, and and, in today's words, this is what I would say. Ask yourself this. Am I a burden carrier or am I a burden giver? If I'm a burden giver, it means I'm coming, me, to the table, and Jesus is probably here somewhere. I'll look for him. A burden carrier says, because of the grace of Jesus... He's allowed me the privilege of being at this table. And because of that, I come humbly and I say, Jesus, you sit down. I'll sit wherever I can. I'll sit on the floor if I have to. I just want to be a part of remembering who you are. So when Paul says, examine yourself, my, in today's language, I'm saying, ask yourself this. Are you a burden carrier or are you a burden giver? That's why later he writes this. He says this, some of us, when we come to the table and we bring ourselves to it, that's why some of us are not receiving God's blessings. In fact, some of us are being, we're receiving God's judgments because we're not remembering Jesus at all. We're only thinking about ourselves. That's what Paul says here to the church of Corinth. So my, my question as we're getting ready to move into a, a time of communion here is, Are we at Second Branch burden carriers or are we burden givers? We come together and we say, how can I grow in my relationship with Christ? It means that I have to be in an accountable relationship with someone where I say, will you pray for me? Because I'm only going to have healing from this when I confess it to someone else who will join with me in prayer, will pick up a shovel and say, let me dig this hole to bury this thing in. Are you a burden carrier or are you a burden giver? You could say this, am I sharing my burdens in order to set an example to those who need to share theirs? Or am I sharing, sharing the things that weigh me down because I want me and my needs to be what's the center of attention here? 
You ask yourself this, am I a burden barrier? Have I repented from my sin and sought forgiveness and healing? So I'm asking all of us right now, I want to just take, take 30 to 60 seconds right now and just examine our own selves and say, where do I fit into Galatians 6? Am I the type of person that can come alongside someone and say in grace and love, gently saying, let me carry this with you? Or am I the type of person that comes alongside and says, I can't believe that you're still carrying this? Let's examine ourselves over the next 60 to, uh, 30 to 60 seconds and say, am I focused on fulfilling the law of Christ by, si- by sharing and carrying someone else's burden, or am I focused on going through the motions of what church is supposed to be like? Let's take this next 30, 60 seconds and pray and say, God, help me when I come to this table, help me to come with you leading me. Let's take this next time and just have a time of prayer. God, help us to be burden carriers where we're sharing our burdens so that they can be buried with someone else's burdens that they're bearing theirs in the same grave as ours. God, carry our burdens for us when we can't do that. And thank you for your church being called your body to do your work where your church is to carry people's burdens just like you did. We can't carry their burdens to eternity, but we can carry their burdens on earth every day. Thank you for allowing us the privilege of doing that. The Bible says this, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what I would like for you to do. I'd like for you to take that little top layer of cellophane, that it's a, it's a clear layer and peel that back. We thank Jesus for his sacrifice. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That word covenant means promise. It's the new promise in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Drink. When Paul writes, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, That's a promise. Jesus is coming again. When he comes, will he find his church fulfilling his law? You might be here today and you've never shared your burdens with anyone, let alone Jesus. The only, listen to me, the only help, the only rest, the only peace, the only comfort that you will ever receive is when you place your faith in Jesus and you allow him to carry your burdens. The rest of the church is called the body of Christ. It was designed to carry people's burdens just like Jesus did. This is what communion is supposed to remind us of. Jesus did all of the heavy lifting at Calvary. He carried our sins into eternity and essentially said they are buried uh, forever. And he's called the church to help people in their daily sins to carry them one more step, 
one more step closer to Jesus. So if you're here this morning and there are things that you're struggling with, burdens that you have, maybe you've never placed your faith in Jesus, and I want to invite you to do that this morning. Perhaps you've walked, you've walked with Christ, but you've kind of walked away from him a little bit, and your burdens are now being passed on to someone else, and you say, I need help burying this. This is the place where you can receive that. But we won't know it unless you share it. So if you want to be a part of what God is wanting to do in our world, you got to be a person who shares their burdens. We'd love to help you if we can. You let us know any way that you can. You can come. We're going to, we're going to sing one closing song here. You can come and, and share that with me or Eric or with a, with a lady if you're a lady. Um, you can share that stuff if you would like, or if you want to wait till the service is over and talk to us then, that's fine. Fill out a connect card. Say, please, Chris, can you be praying for us? Eric, can you call me? I'd like to talk with some. Do whatever you need to do in order to offload that burden onto the body of Christ. Do whatever you need to do, but it is your choice. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word, how it is, it is life-changing. And it is uh, a word that is applicable to us today, even though it has been written thousands of years ago. So God, we pray as a church at Second Branch that we would be burden carriers, that we would be burden sharers, that we would be burden barriers. God, help us, please, fulfill your law. Return us as your church back to a position of power and prominence in this community, in this neighborhood. May Second Branch become the place where people say, that is where you go if you need help. That's where you go if you lack peace. That's where you go if you need comfort because they will carry your burdens with you and they will help you bury those things for good. God, help us become that fulfillment of your law. And all God's people said... Amen. Let's stand together and we're going to sing a closing song together. As we leave, your so what begins at the door. I love you. If we can help you in any way, let us know. Let's sing this last song together.